might as well stay now. You ready, David? Yeah. Three times a week, at his home in an inner suburb of Melbourne, Sailor Bob welcomes whoever turns up. This DVD is an edited version of my first evening session. Hi, Catherine. You know, so it's still, it's still this sort of, I don't know if it's just seeking or it's just going, no, no, the truth's, the truth's in that room. Call it Advaita or non-duality. But it's no more Advaita than what it is Dog Chen, Christianity, Islam, Jewish, or any other tradition or religion. Because ultimately they all point to the non duality, the one without a second. And they put that without a second on because even the implication of one implies that there could be other than one. Some people arrive a bit late. Doesn't seem to worry Bob. We say here right from the start that what you are seeking you already are. I'm not teaching you anything, nor am I telling you anything. So I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm not speaking to any mind. I'm not speaking to that physical appearance, in other words, the body-mind organism. I'm speaking to that I am, that I am. And that I am is not the thought I am, it's to that sense of presence, the awareness of presence or the knowing that you are. The great knowledge or word is I am that. Thou art that. This is that. That's that. Everything, the basic substratum of everything is what they call that. And it's that to which the pointing or the talking is coming from that to that. So in that there is no separation. That's why we say what you're seeking you already are. Each one of us knows I am. And it's not the thought I am that is the reality. It's what that I am is representing, that translation from the sense of presence or the intelligence awareness, the knowing that you are translates as the thought I am. And even while the translation is going on, that thought is going on, that knowingness is there. And if the thought finishes, another thought comes. There is still that basic knowingness you look at it closely, you'll see it's never changed. It's always there. We call it beingness. But again, we're into concepts. Because for beingness to be, there needs to be non-being. There can't be being without non-being. And there can't be non-being without being. So, Cancel out the, both of those terms and where are you? Just like in the seeing. The thought I see comes up. I see this and I see that. But there can't be, and the thought I see becomes a pseudo seer or the subject, and, and the, I see the chair or the table or whatever concept we've got about what we're seeing, becomes the object. So there can't be the subject without the object. And they can't be the object without the sub subject. So again, they cancel each other out. And that just leaves the basic seeing. And you realise they can't be a seer, can't be subjectivised without seeing. Nor can there be the seen without seeing. So the seeing, what we call the seeing, is the actual functioning that's happening right now. Is there anybody here who is not seeing? Anybody here who is not hearing? Anybody here who is not aware of being presence, present, 
or that presence of awareness is not with you. So it's not something that has to be attained or got. You see, it's obvious that without that, nothing could be happening here at all. See how the stars are orbiting, Earth going around the sun, for instance, tides coming in and out, seasons coming and going, how a tree will sprout from a seed or a blade of grass, how an insect will come out of a cocoon, out of a larvae or a stage, or some pupae stage, into a moth or a butterfly with all its glorious colours, how the simple white and yolk in a pea fowl's egg can turn into all those brilliant colours, the sperm and the ovum coming together can form this human pattern with its ability to reason and, and its capacity for inventing and creating art, technology and all the rest of it, implies that this manifestation is suffused with an innate intelligence, innately knowing. And that's the intelligence I'm talking about. Now, that, to me, is what I mean by intelligence. And that intelligence is no thing that you can ever grasp. It's no thing that you can ever conceptualise. No thing that can be ever seen. And that natural state is what you really are, that natural function, the same as in nature, the same as all this manifestation is, naturally aware, self-knowing, self-patterning, self-functioning. And that's why we say, what you're seeking, you already are. Because there's no body here who has ever been away from it, ever could get away from it. It is that one intelligence energy, still one without a second, appearing as thought, feeling, emotion, and everything else. Every shape and form in this manifestation is that appearance. And we know that in our language because we call it a phenomenal universe. A universe made up of phenomena. Look in your dictionary, you'll see that the definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. The opposite of phenomenon is noumenon, the unmanifest. So there's a manifestation, as I said before, as there's being and non-being, and, and an unmanifest. And there couldn't be an unmanifest without manifestation, there couldn't be a manifestation without the unmanifest. But again, cancel them both out, and what's left is what you are. So the definition of the unmanifest, noumenum, is that which it is. So it's the manifest, unmanifest which is the reality. That which is. That which has no shape or form, but you cannot get away from it, cannot negate it. And you can't grasp it, well the same way as you can't get away from it, you can't grasp it with a thought, with a concept, with an idea, with an image. So it's all constantly without the word, without the label. It's just all as it is. Always was, always will be. In reality, nothing has ever happened. It's an uncreated manifestation. It only appears to be so. It means that there is a freedom from this bondage of self, which never existed. You're always free from it, but it wasn't realised. It was believed that I am this self, I am this separate entity. I am this me that's no good, that's limited, that's got no self-esteem, that's unhappy, or it's great, it's wonderful, it's the best in the world. Whatever concepts I've got about it, whatever images I've had, and added to that I thought, and formed a mental picture or mental image of what I believe myself to be. And that is what we call the self-centre or the ego. But that's all it is, a mental picture, a mental image, without any substance or any independent nature. And if you have a look at it closely, you'll see that, that image is constantly changing. Have you got the same image about yourself as you had five years ago, or a week ago, or a month ago, or when you were a little child? You've taken on things, people have said things that you've taken on, and you've let things go, and that image has constantly changed because of the taking on and letting go. It hasn't been something solid and substantial 
that's had any independent nature other than the concepts that have been formed by this erroneous belief. So in seeing that, this idea or erroneous belief in the separate entity has got nowhere to stand. It's got nowhere to stand when it's seen as false. If it's got nowhere to stand on no independent nature, how can anything be referred to it with any belief? And this is what we've done all our lives, from the fine time we first started to reason. When the little child first reasoned, this Johnny they're talking about, this is me, this is I. And as I say, thought being a vibration or a movement of any, what, it vibrates always in the opposite. What's the opposite of me and I? Isn't it not me or not I? And that's the very first time he starts to reason when he looks out there where he's seeing everything prior to that, just as it is. He's now reasoning, this is not me, this is not I. So now there is no I and not I. And when that I or not I idea or sense comes upon him, comes with the sense of separation, where it was never there before. And the sense of separation is insecurity and vulnerable. If you feel separate or isolated from something, you don't know it or don't understand, or you think you don't know it or don't understand, then there's a sense of insecurity there. There's a sense of vulnerability. You don't know what it's likely to do. It's all relative to this image that I've got about myself. I like this. I don't like this. I'm fearful of this. I'm angry about this. I'm resentful. I'm full of self-pity. Or I'm guilty. Or I'm no good. All these images and ideas, this reference point, everything is relative to that reference point. It's judged from there as good bad, pleasant, painful, happy, sad, all based on past events and experiences. It's a dead image that we're always re relative to, something that's dead. Now how can something that's dead, that's got no livingness left in it, it's got to be recalled and remembered to give it any life in the actuality of the moment, which is the only life it ever, ever have, how can we get a valid appearance from an invalid reference point? How can we get a valid understanding of anything? from a dead, invalid reference point. It's just like pulling the bucket of water out of the river. The river's flowed along and left that bucket of water behind. What happens to that bucket of water? It becomes stagnant and dead. And that's what we're continually doing, always referring it to this dead image. So whenever we've got the idea we've got to get something, or do something, or be something, that comes from the belief that we haven't understood or not known it or we are not complete already. And in that belief in non-completeness we'll be forever searching for completeness. And the Buddha's message and the message of all the other great traditions was that you can be free of this psychological suffering. It doesn't have to be that way. The ancients talked about the peace that passes all understanding. And people think they're talking about peace of mind. And they say, I've got to get peace of mind. Not realising that nobody has ever got or ever will get peace of mind. Because the very nature of the mind is to vibrate, is to function. The peace is when the mind is not. And the mind is not when there's no concepts going. And then, without any concept, what can you say about it? Can you say it's anything other than peaceful? Can you even say it's peaceful without a concept? It just is as it is. And that's why they call it the peace that passes all understanding. It cannot be understood or grasped with a concept or with the mind. And that's the natural state. And it's right where you are right now. And where you are is here. And here is always now. People say, what about when I go outside? When you go outside, you'll be here and now. Look at it closely and realise that there's never been anywhere, any time, any place, or anything at all that hasn't been here and now. 
have a look and see. That's all that needs to be done. Now, some of you have looked and have grasped it, got a good understanding of it. And as I say, if anything that's not covered here, other people will probably want to hear this video. And there's some, some good information can come from each and every one of you. So don't hesitate to ask questions or say your piece. You've got to keep going for a long time yet. So. <laughs> you want to add something to that, Jim? Um, I think you did very well, Bob. It was staggering for me to having I heard you the first time, and uh, I got very uncomfortable because it was quite staggering that that the thing that I'd relied on for as long as I could remember was the very cause of my problem, basically the the, the, the belief in this entity that that needed to work things out was really was really the reason I was so uncomfortable. And um, you know, I tried to I tried to find wriggle room, but uh, there basically is no wriggle room. And, yeah, I, I can't change anything. And that's what we say, it resonates with everybody because innately everybody knows it. Innately you've already known it, but it's been covered over by the cloud of conceptualising and we've lost sight of it. But it's everybody, is that? No, it's not special to just the few. It's that knowingness itself which cannot be negated. It's recognising itself. So that spaceless, timeless awareness, the way we explain it that way, actually you can't actually say anything about it because it doesn't have a quality and it doesn't have a quantity. So you can't actually say as a mental construct or in words what it is. No, it cannot be grasped by a mental construct either because... And that's what we've continually tried to do ever since we began to read. We think we'll grasp it with a concept. But as the Sagara says in that video, you're bound to fail. You try to grasp it with the concept and you fail. Because you're bound to fail. Simply, purely and simply because it can never be conceptualised. Give it in one sentence it's non conceptual awareness. Catherine. Well, on that point, I suppose I, I have looked and I've 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 looked and I see that there's something that is aware and yet I can't put any label to it because as soon as I do, it's not that. So, you know, there's hearing, there's seeing, there's like a knowingness, but I can't really say it's any of those things. It's just something there. Mm. Call it life, maybe, but even that. And it's like the mind just is it falls away because um, it's none of those things. Mm. It's like a mystery, I suppose. A bit mysterious. But see what you said earlier, you know, when I look, as soon as I look for it, it's not that. That's right. Well, you're doing what the ancients have done in some of those ancient texts, netty, netty, not this, not this. Mm -hmm. You're doing it naturally. Yeah. Then you're left with nothing. 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 No thing. Magnus. Um, like I, you know, I've had the usual week of being seduced by the whole idea of me being separate in a world, you know, uh, and, and the, my experience of that has been depression. And yet I came along tonight, you know, so it's still, there's still this sort of, I don't know if it's just seeking or it's just going, no, no, the truth's, the truth's in that room. But the reality here is that I still feel that I maybe haven't looked enough at that really fundamental question of saying, look to see where this me is. Yeah, I understand the theory and the intellectual approach there completely. Fortify a sense of separate eyeness and you're going to be in trouble. You'll magnify the suffering and pain, but there's no, it seems no capacity to really see through that illusion 
of a separate self and therefore move to this less pain self. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Mm. You understand it. You've seen that there's no I there, haven't you? I think I have. Yeah, yeah, you have, yeah. All right. Now you go outside on a cloudy day mm. and you can't see the sun. Now, you know, you might go along all day, you don't, don't have to think that I'm not seeing the sun, do you? You're just taking it as a cloudy day. Mm. But at any moment throughout that day, would you have believed the sun had left the sky? No. No. Now the same thing with this. You see me clouded over with thought, and thought's just like a cloud that's covering that natural self-shining awareness. But you've had a taste of it, you know it's there, you know it's your basic essence. Clouds seemingly block it at times, Rays of light will shine through at times and give you glimpses of it. But know that that basic essence, what you are, has always and ever been what you are. It's never ever left. No matter how thick the clouds may, may seemingly be. So I say it's knowing the truth about it that you're free from the bondage of erroneous belief. And we use the metaphor of the blue sea, the water in a mirage, the sun and the cloud, and lots of other metaphors they use to try and point you to it. I wonder if I really do know the truth though, because it's like, it's like it says, something says, okay, well then living in this awareness, where's the joy? Because I'm not going to give up trying to get joy in life until I can see there's joy living in that awareness. <laughs> it's like, it's this weird kind of, you know, show me the money or I'm not coming <laughs> thing. No. He wants to try right. before if, you if, buy if, if you ask yourself, yeah. have you ever done that? that Ask yourself, what's wrong with right now if I don't think about it? Yeah, I did it. It's a lot in the beginning. And you paused, paused for a moment? Yeah. What could you say about that when the thought was paused? Could you say it was unjoyful? No. Could you say it was joyful? No. Could you say, well, that's what bliss is. Yeah, well, a part of me wants to say, that, that's not enough, though. <laughs> Stay with it long enough, yeah. and the subtleness of it, when we become more notice. That means something to me. Yes. We don't we get a glimpse of it and say, well this is not that's not enough. And immediately move back into the old track of trying to find the answer in the mind. Yep. Which is got the sensations will come up, highs, lows, always up low. But that which is constant, that which is steady. Stick with the subtle essence of it. And the sense of well being will be constantly and ever there. Uncaused. It's what I call as the uncaused joy. It's not the opposite of sorrow. They get into the joy, sorrow, love, hate, all that pleasant, painful, mental conceptualisation. And there the great sensations up and down and all this. But we don't say the subtle, the uncaused love, the uncaused joy, the natural compassion, all these things that are there, the courage, the beauty, the love. We put those labels on them. We put the labels on We're likely to get into business with the very labelling. But without a label, just sense these things, know these things, get the taste of them. It's your true nature, it's your natural state, it's there. And the very trying is the trap again. So the problem with any techniques, I mean, uh, there's still an underlying belief that there's a me that's going to sort of detach from my thoughts to watch my thoughts, and, and it's just the same problem once removed, it's just a, the same problem all over again. But, you know, really at its simplest, it's just, you know, when it when it comes to you, what the, you know, I'm not feeling, oh yeah, what that, what that old coots, you know, the bald head say on Tuesday and Thursday nights, oh yeah, he says, go looking for me, and just go looking for me. And, you know, what's wrong with right now, but don't think about it. And, I mean, I could see that straight off. And so that, in the end, you have what other people have naturally, some other people have naturally that they they wear their identity like a loose like a loose garment. Paula, it's becoming very clear that um, you know what we what we see isn't at all substantial. Isn't any more substantial? What we see isn't any more substantial than the beings that we took ourselves to be. Yeah. Uh, all of that is up for grabs. It's just pure potential existing as concretized ideas. What I call effortless living. I wonder so many things get done with this. I often wonder how. 
<laughs> yeah, it's all miraculous. In fact, he says everything is perfectly resolved in the unborn. Yeah, mm. no question. Why exchange the unborn for thought? Mm. That's what I love about coming here, Bob, is that you really you point out the obviousness of, well, not so obvious, but when you point it out, it becomes so obvious that it is only now and everything that's happened, as you say, is okay because it, it all just keeps passing. And unless you think about it, it's, it's really not a problem. It's the amazing thing that's always there as you say, it's, it's always like that, it always is now, it always has been, always will be. Years ago, there was a seaman who went to sea, and I crossed the equator many times. But never once did I have to get out and open the gate, get through the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and when we went across, there was never any bump there. <laughs> We've got this idea. <laughs> if you get up in the space ship and look down, they go say, "Can you see all the borders that are in between these nations?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So much we put beliefs and things on when you look for them, they're not there, you know. Yeah. And then there's the belief that there's a doer there. That's bang. We've got a reference point to evaluate again. Mm. And they judge from there as good, bad, pleasant, painful, happy, sad, or whatever they may be. But if you haven't got that reference point, where are they to be judged from? Yeah. Well, they cancel each other out, doesn't they? Can you live a moment ago? No. No, you can't. You can recall it in the, the moment. The only actuality you're giving it is what you're giving it at this moment in its recollection. Can you live a moment in the future? No. You can imagine it, but you can't live a moment in the future. So when's it actually happening? No. Now. Can you ever get away from now? No. So it's not a matter of staying with it, really. We use that term. It's a matter of realising you can never get away from it, even if you try. Mm -hmm. Even in the very trying. That trying is happening right now. Try to get away from it. So, it's, really, it's not a matter of staying with it, just seeing that no matter what you do, it is always this as it is. And could you say that seeing is just that natural intelligence? As it says in that hinsig me. Emptiness here, emptiness there, yet the infinite universe stands ever before your eyes. Doesn't mean to say that the universe disappears. It's empty, but that emptiness is, you know, it's being, it's there, it's seemingly there. Not being seen because there's no seer. It's, it's still standing. And it says no difference because all boundaries have ceased, you know, taking the boundaries and limitations off. There's a great sense of gratefulness here, or the, anything that happens, it's uh, no matter what, it, I, I, it's great, I feel grateful. Well, it's, it's, it's rather like a game that you play and then you end up here or a place like this where you say oh, if you really seriously sit down and listen you'll stop playing the game you know it's like a sinkhole yeah. Yeah. the thing is if you really sit down and listen you'll see that there's no me that ever played the game if there's no me now when was it ever so you realise it never ever could have been. If it's not there now, it's something that wasn't doesn't exist now, when did it ever exist? It never ever did. And you see that the, the, the so-called game has been expressed or played not by you, the entity, but by that essence is pattern shaped and formed, all this diversity, but never changed its true nature. It's only seemingly so. It's only seemingly so. The game goes on, but it gets much more fun. <laughs> Promise. Mm. <laughs> A word of honour. <laughs> if, if you know there's nothing you can do, you know, what are you concerned about? <laughs>
Well, you, you, must, you must be happy if you're not going to say. Don't rush me, Bob. I'm used to this stuff. How many understandings are there? Two. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>